the thing that some guys will kind of first notice is they're gonna start having erection issues. You know, that's kind of the canary in the coal mine that there's something going on with the cardiovascular system. So welcome back to the TRT and Hormone Optimization YouTube channel. And as a guest today, we have a cardiologist with us. It's Dr. Twyman. Welcome. Thank you for having me today. It's gonna to be fun to chat. Pleased to have you. So uh, let's talk today about cholesterol. It's a topic that we've already discussed a bit on my channel. And um, yeah, we wanted a real cardiologist this time to talk about cholesterol because I think it's still a myth that goes around uh, with many doctors still um, that we should lower our cholesterol as, um, below a certain limit and that it's very important to prevent uh, cardiac disease and so on. So let's talk about that. Maybe first, um, what lipids should uh, we test uh, to know if we are healthy or not? Uh, Sure, it's a great question, the one I get all the time. You know, I usually lead off with, you know, cholesterol is a needed molecule by every cell in your body. Without cholesterol, you're not gonna be alive. But because cholesterol is a waxy compound, it won't float in your liquid blood by itself. So it has to be wrapped up in something called a lipoprotein, basically a lipid protein carrier. And those are for the most part made in your liver. Think of them like a tennis ball that fills up full of the cholesterol, triglycerides, which are energy, fat soluble vitamins, the A's, the D's, the E's, the K's, and things called phospholipids, which are other building blocks for the cells. So the liver makes these little tennis balls and then pops them out and sends them through the blood vessels and then the muscles or whatever organ needs something, grabs onto them and downloads the cargo that it needs. So cholesterol is not the boogeyman. There's really no such thing as good cholesterol. There's no such thing as bad cholesterol. There's just cholesterol. The only cholesterol you don't want is cholesterol building up in your artery walls. And the only way that that cholesterol gets in your artery walls is something called an ApoB containing lipoprotein dropped it off there. So that's mainly gonna be the LDL particles, but it also can be the LPA little particles for the 20% of the population that has LPLLA. Okay, so um, is that something uh, that is measured um, standard in everyone? Because I remember only uh, scratching off on the uh, lab uh, papers, uh, HDL, LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. Correct, and that's a, the traditional lipid panel, and that's a good starting point, but it's not really sufficient to tell you, are you at risk of an event or not? Because half the people who come into the emergency room with heart attacks have, quote, normal cholesterol. So it has to be something more that contributes to the plaque formation. Now, there's always gonna be cholesterol on the plaque, but having high cholesterol isn't always the precipitating you know, risk factor. So on a traditional lipid panel, you know, the main thing that I would look at is, is the total cholesterol over 300 milligrams per deciliter? Is the LDL cholesterol over 190 milligrams per deciliter? If so, that points you towards that that person may have familial hyperlipidemia, a genetic issue where they're just producing more cholesterol or recycling more cholesterol than the normal person. But it's not guaranteed because if you had a normal cholesterol panel, you go on a keto diet or a carnivore diet and your lipids go through the roof like that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have FH or familial hyperlipidemia. Mm -hmm. But it's a good starting point to say, is this like a genetic issue for that person to have, quote, high lipids? The second thing I would look at on a traditional panel is going to be the HDL cholesterol and the triglycerides. And that ratio, if you divide the HDL into the triglycerides, is going to give you a rough estimate of that person's insulin sensitivity. You know, how good are they at burning glucose for energy? Mm -hmm. So the glucose metabolism is important as well to prevent or uh, go to cardiac disease or risk for it. Correct, because if you have hyperglycemia or high glucose, that's gonna damage the protective coating of the arteries. That coating is called the endothelial glycocalyx. It's like a candy, like kind of candy consistency and high sugars damage it. Basically it gives it like a haircut. And then those lipoproteins, which are full of the cholesterol and the triglycerides, they're much more likely to stick to the arteries in that situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, nowadays, most of the patients uh, that aren't even obese or are even lean, uh, as soon as they get over uh, a certain threshold of cholesterol, they are put on statins uh, immediately. So uh, you're, you're not a big proponent of doing that, I guess. Not as a, a blanket statement that, you know, your cholesterol is high, you automatically have to go on pharmacological agents. And SANS are just, you know, a very convenient agent because they've been around for a long time and are generic at this standpoint. But much like, you know, stands are not supposed to be in the water for everybody, stands are a complete poison. You know, for somebody who's already had an event, you know, they've had a heart attack, they've had a stroke, they have stents, they've had bypass surgery. Those people are at high risk of having another event. And in those individuals, stands will reduce another heart attack. They'll reduce the risk of dying. Where people tend to have more trouble kind of understanding risk is the people who are primary prevention, people who have never had an event. 
But even the guidelines sort of miss this gray zone where just because you haven't had an event does not mean that you don't already have significant plaque in your arteries. Because if you don't go looking at what's going on with the arteries, you really don't know what the risk is. You know, just looking at what your quote cholesterol is in your blood is just a snapshot in time. What was going on right at that moment? You know, cholesterol is a necessary, you know, contributor to the plaque in the arteries, but so is inflammation. So is endothelial dysfunction. So it takes more digging than just saying high cholesterol equals statin. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you go to endothelial health? Um, how, how do you do that? Sure. So the endothelium is one cell thick. It lines your entire artery walls. So there's approximately six tennis courts of surface area of the endothelium. One of the major things that the endothelium releases is something called nitric oxide. It's a very short-lived molecule that's a gas that when it diffuses from the endothelium, it will cause the artery in the wall, the, uh, the muscle in the wall of the artery to relax. So that will improve flow down the artery. That's going to keep blood pressure normal. But nitric oxide also has kind of like a protective nonstick coating. When you have high nitric oxide levels, those lipoproteins just zip on through the arteries. They don't stick to the artery walls. So mm -hmm. nitric oxide is really the name of the game to know if you have healthy endothelium or not. Now, there's a few ways you can know if you have healthy endothelial function. So there are salivary nitric oxide strips that you can get, like litmus paper. You put saliva on it. You know, generally, if it's bright red, you're making good nitric oxide through that salivary pathway. You know, there are tests that you can do that look at the elasticity of your arteries. The device that we use in our office, one of them is called the Max Pulse. It's a finger probe, kind of like a pulse oximeter. But instead of measuring the oxygen levels in your finger, it's measuring the elasticity, how fast these arteries kind of expand and contract. You know, it should be like a healthy accordion. If you have sick arteries, it's kind of like a lead pipe. And then we had a person come in today to see us to kind of do the full workup to figure out what they were at risk for. And we did a test called the Endopat. The Endopat test is a 15-minute non-invasive test that assesses the brachial artery reflex. Uh, um, it's called the reactive hyperemia index in your brachial artery. So it's basically a stress test to your artery. And shows you how much nitric oxide can be released by percentage. Normally, you should be able to make 200% of nitric oxide when there's a stressor on your artery. And we stress the artery by basically putting a blood pressure cup on their arm and pumping it up over the blood pressure and temporarily cutting off the flow to the arm. And then when we open up the blood pressure cup, the blood rushes back down in. That blood essentially tickles the endothelial glycocalyx and the endothelium. And then that causes those layers to release nitric oxide to dilate to accept that volume of blood. So that test is kind of the two kind of mechanical tests you can assess for nitric oxide availability. The kind of poor man's way to do it would be, you know, do you have normal blood pressure? If you have normal blood pressure, you very likely have normal endothelial function. And then there's other things they can do from blood tests. There's something called asymmetric dimethylarginine, symmetric dimethylarginine. If those are elevated, nitric oxide is going to be low. If homocysteine is elevated, nitric oxide is generally going to be low. If your acid is elevated, nitric oxide is going to be low. So you just have to kind of figure out which lever you need to pull on to support the body's ability to make nitric oxide. But in your community, the thing that some guys will kind of first notice is they're going to start having erection issues. You know, that's kind of the canary in the coal mine that there's something going on with the cardiovascular system. So I always ask, you know, guys that come in to see me that, you know, are you taking Viagra? Are you taking any of the, the fossil diastrase inhibitors? And it's not a, you know, probing question that like I'm, you know, think it's a bad idea, but it's a marker that if you require those medications to maintain or sustain an erection, that you likely have a nitric oxide issue because that's the way that those medications work. They just keep nitric oxide around longer. But the challenge is those medicines don't fix why you have low nitric oxide to begin with. So that's why you go through these max pulse, endopat, salivary nitric oxide, figure out what's breaking their ability to make nitric oxide. Uh, I know there's a relationship between um, cholesterol levels and testosterone levels as well. Um, can you elaborate a bit on that? So it's complicated on that cholesterol is made primarily de novo inside the cells. So the adrenals, the gonads, they're making their own supply of cholesterol that's going to ultimately come into testosterone. Now, in times of significant metabolic stress, it's going to be the HDL particles, not the LDL particles that are delivering more cholesterol to the gonads and the adrenals to make more steroid hormones. Okay, so uh, someone who is on TRT is at less risk uh, for cardiovascular disease then? Potentially. I mean, in all comers, if you assess somebody's, you know, uh, male sex hormone cascade and they're deficient and they're symptomatic, they're at higher risk of cardiovascular disease because the way I tend to think about it is that, you know, your body has X percentage ability to make energy. You know, your heart and brain require the most energy because they're the most mitochondrial dense organs. If there's a problem with your heart, your body's going to divert energy to your heart and say, 
probably not a great time to reproduce. We don't need to worry so much about hormones. And so it's going to take energy from that system. So when I see really low testosterone levels, you know, I just think it's something's really bad with this person's environment. And we just got to figure out what that is. You know, they have really bad sleep habits. They have sleep apnea. You know, they're not eating enough fat to ultimately make the hormones. So you always got to remove any lifestyle things first. And then what's left over, then you determine, okay, this person is a good candidate for th uh, testosterone replacement, yes or no. But once they're actually on testosterone, yeah, I know that's kind of like the, the benefit to like get them off the couch to get motivated to go, you know, go work on the gym, do the things they need to do to improve their life. But I don't think the data is super clear that, you know, replacing somebody with testosterone that you haven't fixed all the lifestyle things absolutely reduces their cardiovascular risk because testosterone is just a marker for what's going on in their environment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, on this channel, we're also trying to, bit the, uh, to uh, bust the myth that uh, TRT is uh, bad for uh, the heart, that it can cause uh, cardiac arrest and so on. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, when, when testosterone is kept in, you know, I call physiologic ranges, no, there's really no evidence that there's going to be increased risk of arrhythmias or atherosclerosis. Um, now, there are cases, you know, where some of the, uh, the pro bodybuilders are doing things that are not, uh, you know, regulated and they're getting their levels extremely super therapeutically high. And then you can get in some issues with that. But it's not necessarily the testosterone. It's all the other effects, you know, they're having on their, uh, you know, growth hormone, their insulin, their glucose, their, you know, when you get super physiologic, it really is going to start messing with your HDL functionality. And it's more than just, you know, do you have low HDL? It's does the HDL work and actually do its job? HDL is 200 different functions or more in the body. You know, one of them is to go into the artery wall, pull out cholesterol and try to take it back to the liver or the other tissues that need cholesterol. So if your HDL is not working, you basically don't have the, you know, the cleanup crew. So then you can only focus on, well, the LDL side of the story, the ApoBs, you know, do you have to lower those more? Because if they're going to keep damaging the arteries and they don't have HDL, they're going to get into more trouble then. Mm -hmm. Do you have experience with uh, statins uh, lowering uh, testosterone uh, in men? It's, I think it's honestly more of a myth in general. I have not seen significant lowering of, you know, ApoB particles with, you know, stand therapy. And if it was really a concern, you know, that's the thing I want to kind of bust the myth that, you know, if you have high ApoB and you don't tolerate stands because of muscle symptoms, or you just ultimately say, I really prefer not to be on this medication, there are other options. You know, there's azetamide that blocks cholesterol reabsorption in the gut. There's the PCSK9 inhibitors, Repatha, Preluent. Those work on the LDL receptor, you know, keeping your, basically your off ramps, you know, on your liver, clearing those ApoB particles faster. So there's other options than just statins. Mm -hmm. Are there any other hormones that should be checked in people with um, cardiac disease? Are there any other relationships with um, thyroid maybe? 100% on the thyroid. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Is that, yeah, that was actually the way that they would diagnose um dyslipidemia or abnormal lipids before they had all these fancy tests is when people's thyroid dysfunction would show up, you know, they'd be hypothyroid. So if your TSH is greater than 2.5 and you also have low free T4, low free T3, you're likely going to have some significant dyslipidemia because the thyroid plays a huge role in the production and maintenance of the LDL receptor. The LDL receptor is kind of like a catcher's mitt that sits on the outside of the liver and it's just grabbing those LDL particles as they go by. If you don't have enough catcher's mitts, then these particles just keep floating around the bloodstream trying to find an off-ramp, and there's just a better shot, literally shots on goal, that these things are going to bang into the endothelium, and some of them are potentially going to get stuck in the artery and start off that fatty streak and atherosclerotic cascade. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, getting back to cholesterol, um, I, I'm sure there's a, a big difference between uh, lean people and uh, yeah, obese or uh, overweight people in uh, risk of higher cholesterol levels. Um, yeah, uh, how big is that difference, really? I think it more has to do with um, the amount of inflammation and insulin resistance they truly have. Because, you know, I've definitely seen very, very lean people that have severe atherosclerosis and severe dyslipidemia. And it's not always because, you know, they have FH or familial hyperlipidemia. You know, a very good example of this, and I didn't personally see him, but, you know, was, was Bob Harper, the guy from The Biggest Loser. You know, very, very fit professional. Yeah, was in the gym, had sudden cardiac arrest. He was resuscitated by a medical student. They fortunately got him to a cath lab in time. They stented his left interior descending artery. And then on the workup, they found out that he had LPLA, which 20% of the population has. So if you know he was assessed you know, years before that, he probably would have known he was at higher risk for one of these events happening. Mm -hmm. So you just couldn't tell by looking at him from the outside. You know, he had a lot of muscles, very lean. 
he had really, really bad arteries. So that's why I always kind of talk about, you know, testing your arteries or test don't guess. You just don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the same thing goes for, um, uh, as you already mentioned, uh, insulin sensitivity. So people with um, higher hemoglobin uh, A1C they are more at risk for uh, cardiac disease as well. Correct. And you know, I always check hemoglobin A1Cs in uh, people, but you know there are some people that have you know either the trait or full-on thalassemia, and then the red blood cells stick around in their system for like four months, and they're going to have higher hemoglobin A1C just because the red blood cells stick around longer than 90 days. So I use it as a kind of starting point. But the other things that if you have you know your labs in front of you, on a traditional lipid panel, I would look at you know if you have low HDLC. Now, what is low? Generally, under 35 is going to be low in my book. You know, if you have triglycerides, most labs are going to say you know over 150 is high. But in my mind, if your triglycerides are over 80, that's elevated. Then if you have access to one of the advanced lipid profiles, you're going to look at not only the total number of particles you have, but you'll look at the small LDL particles. If you have a lot of small LDL particles, you're very likely insulin resistant. And then the other things you can look at, obviously, are just fasting insulin levels because it's going to be your insulin that's high for a long time before your fasting blood sugar is elevated, before your hemoglobin A1C is elevated, because your pancreas is just trying to crank out more and more insulin to keep your blood sugars in normal range, and eventually it kind of loses the battle, and then the blood sugars start to rise. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, okay. I think uh, that was a very quick uh, answers to all my questions <laughs> in the relationship between hormones and uh, heart. Um, anything else you could uh, think of in the relationship between hormones and uh, heart health? So the one. So the one thing I would uh, ask is that, you know, if this is interesting to you, just talk to your doctor about doing these more advanced type of labs. You know, they're not super expensive. You know, the number one thing I would check is check an ApoB. That's the really the lipoprotein that you want to know. If your ApoB is over 80, you probably want to have some type of test that tells you, are your arteries healthy? Yes or no. And I can talk about those in just a second. Also, at least have your LP little a checked one time in your life. It's a less than a $20 test. If your level is normal, it's always going to be normal. But if it's elevated, you're at higher risk of having events, at least double over the general population. So you may need further follow-up by a you know, preventive cardiologist or a you know, primary care doctor who's very interested in prevention. But the arteries is really the name of the game. You know, I look at lipid panels all day long, but again, half the people that show up in the hospital with a heart attack have normal cholesterol. So it's more than that. So you have to look at the endothelium. I already mentioned some of those tests, the max pulse, the endopad, blood pressure. Then there's two main tests I routinely check on almost every man over 40. There's a test called the carotid intimal medial thickness test. It's an ultrasound of the artery on the side of your neck. It will assess if there's any plaque in the artery, but it will also assess how thick the intima is, the layer in the artery below the endothelium. The thicker that layer, the more inflammation in the artery wall. The more inflammation in the artery wall, the more likely plaque is starting to build up. That test will also give you a vascular age. So if you're a guy who's 45 years old, but your arteries are 65 years old, was well, Thomas Sintham, the physician in 1600, said, a man is as old as his arteries. And I say, you also have a big problem. Now you've got to figure out why those arteries are inflamed and what you can do about it to reverse that plaque and that inflammation. And the second test I recommend people consider getting is known as a CT coronary calcium scan, or calcium scan for short. It's about $100 here in St. Louis where I'm located. It's a low-dose radiation scan that is basically like a mammogram for the heart. Calcium is supposed to be in your bones. It's not supposed to be in your artery walls. The more calcium in your artery walls, the more evidence that you have plaque building up in your artery walls. So if your calcium score is zero, you're generally going to be pretty low risk. And then those are the people that have, quote, mildly high cholesterol. You probably don't need to be so worried about them. But if somebody has this, you know, calcium score test of 400 and elevated cholesterol particles, they probably should be considering some type of lipid lowering therapy to reduce the further plaque buildup. I mentioned that earlier. You know, somebody's already had an event. You know, they have a stand, a heart attack. They've already declared themselves high risk. You're going to treat them as such. But it's those people who you think they're low risk, but they're really intermediate risk. Even the guidelines, we're starting to talk about the calcium core test being kind of the tiebreaker between low risk, don't, you know, don't consider stand therapy, and higher risk, consider stand therapy. So don't base your decision to start stand therapy just off a of blood level. You know, you want to know what's going on with your arteries. Great. Awesome advice. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay. So, um, yeah, talk to you another time. Thank you so much again, awesome. Dr. Twyman. You're very welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye.